Well, greetings to you once again, my brothers and my sisters in Christ Jesus. I greet you in that name that is above every other name, at the name of Jesus Christ. Every knee bows, every tongue confesses, because He, the Lord Jesus Christ, is Lord, and He's above it all. And in Him we live and we move, and we have our being. We This is our existence while we're here in this time. Uh, time and space existing here on this planet um, in a paradigm, in a state of primary consciousness where when when you go to sleep, your consciousness is somewhere else. When you wake up, <laughs> well, here you are. And, um, and God has a reason and a purpose for us being in this <clears throat> primary state, um, all of us that are here right now for this window, for such a time as this, God has a reason for it. God has a purpose for it. God has an eternal, um, there's an eternal set and an eternal setting that, that can only be accomplished in this paradigm where the wheat and the tares grow together. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very unique situation that we actually have here in this life uh, doesn't really happen like this because you know how how can you get both light and dark to coexist in the same paradigm it, this was it's actually is a master stroke of god's design to allow for this <clears throat> to have a, a a paradigm where where you can have both light and dark existing where you can have people actually able to make free will decisions and free will choices and uh, to see the consequences of those choices. And we've discussed this before here, um, just sharing the wisdom of, of the ages, which is you can you can choose to do whatever you want. You just can't choose the consequences. So we can choose, we can make choice. And this is why, you know, even on the, the faithnix, uh, faithnix.com homepage, since we set up the site ages ago, from the very bottom of the side, it said, "Choose ye this day whom you will serve." You know that was that was the instruction that that Joshua gave to the people in a time of decision. And right after that, when he gave that instruction, he also said, "As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." He, <clears throat> because he also recognized the byproduct of choosing to go another way. Joshua had seen a lot of people die. Joshua had seen a lot of people cut off by God. Joshua had seen a lot of people forget the miracles of God, forget the power of God, forget the one that liberated them and brought them out of slavery and bondage. A lot of people, he, he had seen a lot of death and destruction and, and carnage and, and also miracles and power and, and the glory of God, you know, because he also... Um, was right there with Moses in a lot of situations. He had seen the glory of God. So for Joshua, <clears throat> when he made that statement, he said, well, look, you, you know, if this is <laughs> for you guys, if you haven't quite figured this out yet, then you guys make a choice and you make a decision. But as for me and my house, um, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we get it. You know, we understand. We we know the way that 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 um, is the path that leads to life, and that is our choice, our decision. No, no matter what this life may bring, we will seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We will go forward in the things of God. We will go forward in that which is life and that which is truth. <laughs> and um, you know, in the process of doing that. <clears throat> Well, in the process of doing that, now now you actually have opposition. Now you actually have an enemy. Now you actually have something that comes against that decision and that choice that you made. You know, the it's it's the moment that you make the decision to follow Christ for real. That's the moment that all of a sudden that you really find out in the realm of the spirit that you have an enemy. See, before that, you, you, if you were just kind of going with the world, you know, going along to get along, well, in that situation, in that state, you're not a threat to anything. 
You're not a threat to waking up anybody else. You're not a threat yourself to, to, uh, to, to, to stepping off, to stepping off of the wheel and to stepping out. And you're not a, you're, you are <clears throat> in that state participating and your spiritual and your physical endeavors are building the world and the world system. So, of course, you, you don't have the opposition of that entire second heavens um, and that entire fallen satanic structure to come against you, to oppose you, to destroy, to, uh, to hinder, to battle against you. But the second that you say you, you recognize Christ in you, the hope of glory, you see who the Lord Jesus Christ is, and you of your free will and you of your volition make the decision to follow him. Because Jesus said, my sheep you know, my sheep will, will know my voice. They won't follow another. So when you make a decision to follow him and Christ in you, the hope of glory has now been revealed as all creation is earnestly groaning for the revelation of the sons and daughters of God, sons and daughters of the living God. When, when you have been revealed and shown for who you are, well, now that which is against God, that which is anti-Christ, comes against you. <clears throat> that which is anti-Christ, anti-truth, now is all that is in that kingdom is set against you and set against Christ in you. Because why? Because you are engrafted into Christ. You are engrafted into the vine, John 15. You are in him, and in him you live and move and have your being. And as you are in him now, you are, are apart from the world. Because now you've been taken from, as, as uh, Paul talked about it in Acts 26, you've been taken from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, when he speaks about his own experience. So his own experience was being taken and being taken out of the world and being engrafted into Christ. When you are taken out of the world and you're engrafted into Christ Jesus and you're one with him, now you are actually a representation of Christ on the earth. You're an ambassador of Christ, but it's not like... It's, it, there is no separation at this point. See, this is, again, too, uh, one of the um, heresies of the religious systems of the world, which is <clears throat> you go there to, and then somebody tells you, okay, now this is what God is saying. Now this is what God is doing. Now God is over there, and you're over here. You've come to the box, and now let's talk about what God said to us. And God's still over there. God's still separate from you. No, that, that was the curse of the law. That was the old covenant. That was something that Christ Jesus finished and did away with and died so you didn't have to deal with that anymore. Jesus said, a time's going to come where they're going to kick you out of the synagogue because of your belief in me. So they're going to kick you out. They're going to put you out just like they put him out just like they, they would go after him. They're going to put you out of the synagogue. But it doesn't matter because God lives in you. Because you are the temple of the living God. You know, that if you, if you, if you look at the, even the breakdown of the temple um, in, in the way that God had designed it, when he gave Moses the revelation with the outer court, the inner court, the Holy of Holies, and, and just even that in the way that you are designed as a human being, with your physical body, your mental, and then your spiritual makeup. And God is even, <clears throat> he, he designed and gave a physical representation of a temple, at first a tabernacle, which was in the wilderness, then the temple with Solomon and, and the children of Israel. But for you to have an understanding that ultimately... You are the temple of the living God. And he doesn't dwell in temples made by human hands. But he chooses to live within us. Christ in you, the hope of glory, is what the scriptures say. So, so now that you are the, the actual temple of the living God, the spirit of the living God lives inside of you and you walk around to and fro on this earth, not separate from God, not in this place of, okay, um, 
you know, got, you've got to always check back in. No, you live in that place. So when the scriptures talk about praying continually, why? Because you're continually connected. There is no separation. Now, the enemy wants to separate you. That's a separate, that's a different matter. The enemy wants to separate you from who you are, but that's a different matter that from your spiritual state, from your destiny, from who God intended you to be. So there is, <clears throat> there is a battle on for your mind. There is a battle on for your spiritual, um, your spiritual destiny, for the fulfillment of who you are on the earth in this time, at such a time as this. All of that is there. It's very real. <clears throat> and, you know, would, would to God that, that people would have five minutes of their life where they at least would have lived in purpose. Because at least that five minutes would have counted for something on the eternal scale. But there's people that live an entire lifetime that never connect, never walk in Christ, never uh, never are who they were meant to be. And that entire life is a waste. That entire existence didn't mean anything. And that's it's just and that's just this that's just the reality of, of of the scriptures. That's just the reality of the choices that people make. You know, the rich young ruler that came to Jesus when he asked him, he he said, Lord, what must I do? And Jesus gave him, went through the commandments with him. He said, I've done all this stuff since I was a kid. What else do I lack? He knew there was something that he lacked. He knew there was something that was missing. And Jesus cut straight to the heart of the matter. And he said, well, if, you know, okay, you want to dig a little deeper. And that's what God will do. He'll dig a little bit deeper. He'll take you one more layer He'll, he'll, that light of truth will come in one more layer to see all right, how, how far do you want to go with this? How far are you willing to go with God in this? And he cuts down one more layer. <clears throat> and the next layer that he cuts down into, he said, okay, first go sell everything that you've got and then come and follow me. Now, and, and it's said that when, when the guy heard this, that his face... He, his face got sad. He was super excited before that because, yeah, he's, he's doing everything that God is telling him to do. But now he got sad. And why did he get sad? Because Jesus tapped on that nerve. Jesus tapped on that, that thing that was within him a priority. Within him, something that he held dear. Within him, the thing that was what he served. And God has a way of doing that. God has a way of digging a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper until you get down to the root of who you really are and who we really are. And 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 either he is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And so if he is Lord of all, then whatever it is that he would ask, however <clears throat> however difficult it may be, is is the way that you will go. So with with the rich young ruler, he now Jesus didn't ask of any person something that he himself would not do. And that's also a mark of leadership by the way, you guys, is that a, a true leader will not put people you will not ask them to do something that he or she in themselves would not be willing to do or have not already done. Jesus Christ himself <clears throat> gave up the glory and the riches of heaven to be made and fashioned in human likeness and to come in our form. I mean, talk about, you know, giving up everything. And so he's telling to this rich young ruler who's got, you know, a few trinkets in this life to come follow me while he had given up everything to come here to die on a cross for the sins of the world. So he's not asking for something outlandish c compared to what he's already done for us. When when God asks us to do something, it's not something that is beyond the stretch of what we can do. But it usually is something that tests the the bounds <clears throat> of where we've been willing to go with him. And this is why, too, the fastest way 
if you want if you want to progress all right you know that i know there's people sometimes that they they want to progress in their spiritual life and all of that kind of thing okay the fastest way you want to know the fastest track all right all in 100 percent every day every moment that's it that's the fastest way if you want to if you want to 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 go forward in the things of god that's the way you withhold nothing of yourself you give god complete total control and you see what he does with it and you know the early the early apostles that's kind of what they all did <clears throat> you know they all i mean you've got Peter, James, and John, they, that they did what the rich young ruler wouldn't do. They were washing their nets. They were with their fishing boats. They were there with their dad, you know, James and John were. And they left all to follow Jesus. You know, Levi, <coughs> the tax collector, Matthew, left it and went to follow Jesus. Left, left the booth and went to follow Jesus. They, they left all... For what? For that pearl of great price. They left all for that which was real. They left all for because they knew that the reality of what they were in, even though they tried to make a life for themselves in this world, tried to do certain things, but they knew that wasn't it. And when, when the revelation of truth crossed their path, there, that was it for them. And they were not <clears throat> going to they were not going to let that pass. If, if they had an option to follow, they would follow. And they did. And, you know, it, didn't, <clears throat> it, came, it came at a price. It cost them their dreams, their hopes for what it was that this life would be, whatever those may have been. And each person may have their own idea. It cost them that. But also, the, they found the reality of the truth which was, <clears throat> Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. In the process of leaving everything, they found and received an abundant life. They received far more than they would have ever dreamed or been able to do or create apart from Him. And that's one of the paradoxes of, of the Gospel. One of the paradoxes of the Gospel is that in letting go, we in, and in in giving we receive. In in seeking, you know, and, and in letting go we find. And and in and in giving up of yourself for the things of God, you actually receive to overflowing in a way that you would never have experienced otherwise. So it's a paradox. And the world doesn't want you to experience that paradox. So what does it do? It continues to program you with a zero-sum game mindset, a lack and a poverty mindset. I, mean, I cannot even tell you the number of people that I know in the world that have resources in the world and live in a mental state of lack and poverty because they, they've, they've never tapped into the true riches that are available in Christ. So they're always, always, always um, just in fear because they don't have life, so they're afraid of death. They don't, have, uh, <clears throat> they don't have the assurance of the provision of God, so they never have enough. And when, when, but when you have Christ, you have the promises of God, and the promises of God cover everything. They cover your entire existence while you're here. They cover your entire direction while you're here. They cover the authority that's necessary for you to do the things that God has given you to do while you're here. All of those things are covered, in, in, in and there's provisions for your health. There's provisions for your mind. There's provisions for your family. There's provisions for generational blessings that can get passed down. There's All of it is covered in Christ. And in the midst of tragedy and trauma, there's also, um, there's also the Word and the Spirit that can, can lead and show. You know, I was, I was thinking about the, the context of Job. My gosh, what a, what a, I mean, can you, just the, he had seven sons and three daughters, and they were all wiped out in a moment. I mean, that, 
yeah, go go read that book sometime and just you know, in the context of that, he lost everything that he owned in the world and his entire family, um, all of his kids. And in the midst of that, you know, there's, 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 I mean, incredible, incredible human struggle and anguish. But God is in the middle of all of that too. And, you know, the close of it, everybody likes to get to the close of, of, of the book of Job and see, you know, how God does the restoration and all the rest of that. But they don't sometimes appreciate the dynamic of that pain and that trial and that anguish and that human experience. And what God put and what God puts his people through. Uh, in Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah 55, it says that it was the will of God to crush his own son. So God crushed his own son for us. Now, um, you know, this is, this is not, this is, this is, uh, it, it gets real. You know, when you, when you read what happened, uh, there's, Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you, if you guys get a chance and you, you want to do some reading sometime, that's one where it talks about how so many people of the gospel died and how they went to their deaths for, for one thing, one thing only, and that was because they followed Christ. And that, if you want some perspective sometimes, that, that's a good one to, to help remind us because this world is not our home and this the the system that is at enmity with god babylon mother of harlots in you is all the blood of the prophets and the saints so the world system is one that has has continually oppressed and destroyed and come after the children of the living God. Now, the dynamics are shifting. Things are, are changing. God is doing something right now in our day. Um, this is something that's been foretold a long time ago and is now coming to pass. And we're seeing this transition. We're seeing this shakeup. Now, we talked a little bit last time on um, Satan's End. wanted to pick up a little bit more. I'm going to read you guys something from just these are words of Christ and things that God had said about uh, Satan's kingdom. This is out of books of uh, Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John. Okay. And we read a little bit of this last time, but I'm going to go through this again. Jesus said, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself and cannot stand but has an end. And if I, by Satan, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Let them be your judges. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come upon you. When a strong man that is armed keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor, which he trusted in, and divides his spoil. But no man can enter into a strong man's house and take his goods unless he first bind the strong man. Then he will take of his goods. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathers not with me scatters everywhere. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, I will return unto my house from where I came out. And when he comes, when he, and when he has come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. It is the devil that catches the word out of the hearts of men when they don't understand it, lest they should believe and be saved. Satan savors not the things that be of God. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth 
because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks his language, for he is a liar and the father of it. <clears throat> he is a thief coming only to steal, kill, and destroy. But now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, because the prince of this world is judged. And I beheld Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I give you power and authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. Rather, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> so this is what Jesus has said um, about Satan's kingdom. This is what Jesus has said about Satan's fall. This is what Jesus has said about Satan's end. Now, last time we discussed a little bit about things when, when you are going to experience the end of the enemy in his ability at, to impact your life. And this, listen, is you going to you're going to be you're on a war fit footing the entire time that you're here in this life. That's part and parcel of your journey in this world. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I've overcome the world. Is what Jesus told us, right? Okay, so you know this, but if you're going to see the, if you're going to see victory, if you're going to be an overcomer, if you're going to walk in that. Then, it, rather than this defeatist mentality, rather than the victim mentality, which the world wants to push on you, why? Because the world wants you to get get you to accept, in your mind, the position of a victim. Because if you can accept the position of a victim, now you are the 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 you are in the position of of less power and of being able to be victimized by the person that has the power over you to do that to you. So the world wants you to accept that position, which is anti-Christ, because what did Jesus say? He said, I give, he said that I, behold, I give you power and authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, if Jesus said that <clears throat> to you as a follower of Christ, if Jesus said that to you as a follower of Christ, how can you be the victim of the devil if God has given you the power and authority to tread on the serpents and the scorpions and over all the power of the enemy? How is that possible? If God gives you the power to, to over the enemy, how is it possible for the enemy than to be the one to victimize you. You know, this is, this is again, why, where does this come from? This is the assault on your mind, my brothers and sisters. This is the assault on your spirit. This is the assault that comes from the enemy all the time. And you know what? It's not going to stop. The enemy is going to barrage your brain, your mind, 24-7, because of the stakes are so high. Because if you tap into who you are in Christ, and if you move in that place, and if you move in that authority, and you move in that position, it's game over. When the children of the living God understood who they were and moved in that power and in that authority, it was game over. Because when they traveled all over the world, when they spoke, spoke the truth when they preached the gospel things changed people were healed life was everything was uprooted the, the kingdom of the enemy was falling apart left right and center that's one of the reasons why in 313 AD Constantine merged Christianity with the Roman Empire because that was that was part of the the move of the enemy to do what to uh it was to to bring to to try to that was a move done on purpose to take the church and the body of Christ and your spiritual walk out of the marketplace out of the house out of who you were and make it a place that you went something you did so that was that was part of the strategy because 300 years of getting kicked all over the place, the enemy now said, okay, we got to 
change it up here. And so these strategies that are created in the second heavens among the principalities, among the satanic structure that's there, that then get handed off to the powers and to the implementing bodies within there, and then they pass it off to the human agents and to the demonic forces that do that. This is the way that they went forward. And what did they do? They, they brought everybody into the church, quote-unquote, the building of the church, the structure of the church, the beautiful facade of the church. But if you read the scripture, you are the church. You are the ecclesia. You are the body of Christ. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Where does that take place? That takes place anywhere that you, you are with a brother or sister in Christ. Does that even require a physical location? Well, right now, are you and I gathered together in the name of Christ? Is Christ among us right now? Is his spirit here right now? Is this word not witnessing to your heart and to your spirit? Is something inside of you saying yes and amen? Okay, well, welcome to church. Did you have to go somewhere for that? Brothers and sisters, it it is time to shake off the the shackles of your mind and the things that, get, that the enemy has put on you so you can recognize and realize who you really are and move in that reality. You know, I remember the story I, I read a long time ago. It's about how they would train these little baby elephants in the circus. And, and when they first would get these little elephants, they would uh, have a stake that they would, they would tie this around, a chain around their ankle, and they would put the stake into the ground. And they would hammer it into the ground, and this little elephant would try to pull and pull and pull on the stake, and uh, he could never get away. So the little elephant just learned to, that every time the stake was in the ground, that he couldn't go anywhere. And then, as the elephant grew, got bigger and older and stronger and, could do, and became this physical powerhouse... Because he had learned about this stake that would be put into the ground, when he got big and strong, he never tested that. And later on in life, when they wanted to just keep the elephant in the same place, they just put the stake, just tap it in the ground a couple of times. The elephant could easily walk away if he just took one step. But they never did. Because they had learned they had learned in a weakened state. They had learned in, in, in a state of just coming in that you don't test that, you don't try that, because nothing's going to work. Okay? Well, let's fast forward to our own lives. You know, we all came out of spiritual bondage and spiritual slavery. We were all taken from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. God did that with all of us. But so many of us were trained in the world and by the world that you don't question this, you don't try this, you don't move on this, you don't, you don't do something contrary to uh, this expectation of the way that everything is and the way that everything always will be. So you learn not to do that. You learn not to pull against that stake. And though God has built strength in you and stamina in you and given you weapons of warfare and built you up, you still stay stuck in that same position. You refuse to make a move because why? Because you tried so many times before and you couldn't move. Try again. Try one more time. You know, how often do people give up a stone throw away from their victory? Just a little bit further. You remember Peter with Jesus, and Jesus showed up first time, and uh, he he preaches and from his boat, and then he tells Peter, you know, toss out your 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 nets for a catch. And what does Peter say? He says, "God, I've been <clears throat> we we've been we've been toiling the whole night. We haven't caught a thing, but nevertheless, at your word." We'll, we'll give it a shot. At your word, we'll do it. 
And he did. And scriptures say that, that there was so much fish in his nets that their nets began to break and they had to call their friends. Their friends came out with other boats and they, they had, just because there was such a huge catch, I think it was 153 fish that they caught. They counted them up. And he was floored by that. Peter was floored. Now here's one of the big differences. One of the big differences is when God tells you to go, when he tells you to throw down your nets for a catch. This is, this is again back to the part of Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the part where you are not separate from the vine. You are one in him. And in him you live and you move and you have your being. You've got to do it like that. So when God gives you the move and he tells you, throw down your nets, that's where you see the miraculous happen. You know in yourself that you're, if, you, if it was just you, you're going to be that little tiny elephant stuck there pulling against this stake and you're in prison. Well, welcome to life because everybody's like that apart from God. You have no hope to get out or to move or to be set free in yourself. We never did. So to give up on that, human efforts which can never save, human efforts which can never set free, human efforts which will never be able to, um, to solve any of the, the true questions of this life, or or set anybody free. The best you can do with your human efforts is you can maybe, you know, you can maybe get a little bit of of uh, knowledge on some of the human dynamics. But nobody's free in themselves. They just kind of move the the furniture around the deck of the Titanic for a couple more days. But nobody's free. But when God gives you the move. When God gives you the move and he says, this is what you do, and you do it, you see now the miracle of God take place in your own life. Whether it's Peter with a catch of fish, which got his attention, and he wanted to follow God, and he went with him from that point forward. And yes, Peter had his problems and his issues, and he slipped away, and God found him again. Peter was all over the place, but I love Peter because he was willing to make a move. I love Peter because he was willing to make a move. You know, even if he didn't have it down, but he's like, Psh, I'll do it. I'll jump out on the water and I'll walk with you, Jesus. Sure, I'm gonna sink. <laughs> I'm gonna start. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm. I'll be walking on the water for one minute, look all over the place the next, and start to sink. But I'm still gonna call out for you. But Peter is willing to make a move. Moses. Moses was willing to make a move. It took him 80 years to get to that point. But he's willing. When God met him in the wilderness at the burning bush. Send the old guy with the stick to go set my people free. If you start reading some of these things, some of these examples in the scripture, and you really think about it, you can see how outlandish some of these examples are how outmatched and outgunned they are, the children of God are, when they go up against the world and all its power and all its pomp and circumstance and fury. Gideon, 300 guys, 300 men, cuts the army down from 30,000, they lose 20,000, they lose another 10,000, 300 men and some clay pots. There's some clay jars. But that's all God needed to wipe out an entire army that was coming against them. Why? Because God would not, there's no need for God to share his glory with man. He doesn't need man to do this. He gives us the option and the opportunity to work with him, to partner with him, to experience. And yes, God's method throughout history has been to work through and work with his people. But so often, you know, he's he's just giving us the chance to be part of this, to trust him. He wants to see you and I trust him in this 
And he gives us the option. He's like, look, I'm putting it in front of you. And there's a lot of people that refuse that. The many are called, but the chosen are few. Just because God calls people doesn't mean that they respond. There's a lot of people that go away sad, like the rich young ruler did. And you know what? Sometimes you don't get that chance back. But when you do get the opportunity, and when God does call, that is your chance and your opportunity. Take it and go with Him. And recognize and realize that He is given you the power. He's given you the authority. He's given you the direction. You need that. No man should teach you, for the Holy Spirit will teach you when He comes upon you. That's what the Scriptures say. So you don't need a teacher. Everything that you've heard here even today, all that is done is reinforce what you already know in your own spirit that God has already put within you, and you know that. So when you listen here, you're just getting a reinforcement of what's already there inside your own spirit and your own heart, and you know that. So that being the reality, that being the truth, you want to move in that. So... <clears throat> Yes, um, recognize and realize and tear down every stronghold because God's given you the power to do that. Tear down every stronghold within your own life and recognize that God is not just doing this within you and within different places and, within, and among people, but he's also doing this around us in the larger world that we're part of. God is, um, he is, he is now in the process of of uh, continue to move forward and fulfilling his word which is going to be um, this he, he's fulfilling he's moving forward and Christ came and the reason that Christ Jesus was manifested was to destroy the works of the devil and he is destroying the works of the devil in the day and the age that we're living in so truth is coming out light is moving forward uh, his plan and purpose is continuing to advance. This is an amazing time to walk with Christ and to do the things that God has given you to do because you're going to see and to experience the power and the miracle of God in all that goes on around you. So one thing that, that, that you and I want to do is to get on his page. And you do that right now. You do that in the moment that you have because he is I am. God is I am. He's not... Somewhere in the future, he's not in the past. He's right now. He's the God of the living. And you are alive in Christ. So walk in that life. Be what God made you to be. We love you guys. God bless you. Drop us an email, faithmix at gmail.com. And you can say hi there. And um, yeah, we appreciate you guys. So God bless you. Keep on keeping on. We'll catch up with you again sometime. Really soon. All right. God bless you. Bye.